Hello everyone and welcome to Art and Business. Today I'm joined by Andrea Hintereke Di Maio. She's a curator, a gallerist. Uh, she's also a director at the May 36th Gallery for Latin American Art. She's a guest lecturer at the University of Zurich and she published this book uh, called Nuances of Latin American Art in 2020. And I'm very pleased to have her here today with me. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Tanya. So, so many things that you do. Uh, I mentioned a few, um, but when people ask you, what do you do? Um, what do you tell them? Well, up to last week, I thought or I told them that I'm a, a problem solver. And then obviously the conver conversation starts and then they say problem solver. They think in a different direction of uh, it's obviously a small joke. Then I go art problem solving. And from now on, I'm saying an art problem um, solution looker first before the problem starts. I first find the solution or see what what or actually create a problem. So I, I have the solution, <laughs> something like that. In the middle of all of this. And, and, and what triggered you to, to say now that you're an uh, art problem finder? Or um, I'm reading at the moment a lot because I'm preparing myself for um, next week. I'm starting a, a class at the University of Basel on the subject digital and culture. And uh, so I came a lot, a lot of inspiration and, and this sentence popped out and I said, well, actually it's quite old fashioned if you say you're an art problem solver. Uh, it's actually better if you, you find the problems first and then you bring the solutions. <laughs> okay. And, and what kind of problems are you finding at the moment? Well, at the moment, obviously, there are quite a few problems um, around through through COVID. But I also think in, in general, we are in the middle of a society change and and the area change of the to the or we are in the middle of the forced uh, industrial uh, time and the digital area is moving so fast that it scares us also. And, and we try to find to adjust to it. And there are many, many problems. I also think the value of things have changed. Um, and this is not only through COVID, this is more actually that we are living at the moment in a different time frame. So for example, people have uh, a lot of things mm -hmm. and uh, we are, don't realize how much we have. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a prime example of last year on a mandate I had on a collection. They said, ah, I have like uh, 20, 30 pieces. And we are calculating, we do the inventory, we, uh, we digitalize everything, we do the appraisals and all of that. And we are now at 520. And you must pieces. Pieces. And you must imagine this, this, is, this is actually exactly the point. We think we have nothing, but we have a lot. So uh, you with your you have an agency as well, a creative culture agency called Artrepco. That's where you do the appraisals and inventory, digitali digitalize art for your clients. Would you also say that one can have too much art? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Never. <laughs> um, I think, you know, for me, contemporary art is always the mirror of the so society we live in in the current state. So whatever triggers us off, it is an artist sees the world different, they structure the world different. And for me, the, the biggest enrichment they bring to me and nature is actually to, to open thinking strategies. So I see a bright future actually for art and artists. Mm -hmm. Because today's in the company, you know, we are like little aunts. I mean, I'm not, but a lot of them are little aunts mm -hmm. and they do their job from A to Z. And if they lose their job, they lose all the structures, everything. Mm -hmm. And today, or let's say in 20 years time, you probably don't do the same as we did today. Mm -hmm. In the same way, when I started my education, um, I was 16. Mm -hmm. I didn't know where I would end up. And at that point, it was important that you choose a job where you're going to have for the next 40 years because the last 40 years, it was done that way. This has changed completely. If you do today in education, you have to be prepared to change every 15, 20 years or maybe even less. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe the times of it gets even more quick. So one lesson I learned so far, you, you never know too much mm -hmm. and it's different in knowing things than creating knowledge. I think that's one of the key words for the future for me personally, and I think for the rest of it as well.
because you can Google everything. Mm -hmm. So that's not not an not a prime subject anymore if you have read a lot. Mm -hmm. It's more what you do with your knowledge and how you create that knowledge. Mm -hmm. And then where it becomes very interesting, or at least for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned you started your uh, working career at the age of 16. You did a banking apprenticeship, very typical for, for Switzerland. And also, I remember when I was young, it was something very well seen if you did a banking apprenticeship. And then you worked as a broker in the financial world. What led you to the art world then? Well, first of all, I mean, kind of family background, but more on the musical side, mm -hmm. so not in art, art. And in the banking area, I started because everyone told me, you cannot. You're a girl with your background, where you're from, that's not. And then I did the bank apprenticeship and I said, okay, you did it, but now you have to become a secretary. Mm -hmm. And me, I'm the worst secretary <laughs> on the planet. You know, I. If this I, is what people told you? Yeah, this is what people told me at that stage mm -hmm. of, of where I was, mm -hmm. you know, at 18. And I said, like, nah, I don't want to do that. So I chose to go in uh, foreign exchange dealings. And then everyone said, no, you cannot do that. There are no women. It's too tough. And I said, like, who is telling me all the time what I can do and what I cannot do? Mm -hmm. And so I started in that. And I was successful because I think I got overlooked mm -hmm. because no one... They didn't thought I was a threat. Mm -hmm. I think at that time when people would have thought closer, mm -hmm. they would have probably cut me off because they probably, mm, she might be a threat. Mm -hmm. So this is how I prolonged my career. Mm -hmm. In the same way I went to London, I asked my boss to say, look, now I know everything what I can mm -hmm. learn here. I need the big world. I want to conquer the world. It's mine, no? But I was beginning of 20. I mean, and for wow. every person, you know, if they have the chance, go and conquer the world mm -hmm. or go and get the chance mm -hmm. even if it's not the world the next village whatever mm -hmm. so i saw like yeah so i left you know with my two suitcases and i left to london and i thought like hey here i am eh? <laughs> and everyone was like yeah, yeah. <laughs> see you later and i was like uh, excuse me it's me andrea and so i had to learn that obviously no one was waiting for me and obviously it was very tough at the beginning but that's how i started in london and and there again, they said like, ah, you know, this Swissy, Brazilian, whatever she is, uh, you sit her on the table and you give her a big book where all the bank's name were, you know, was writing in there. And they said, well, go and find your clients. And obviously I started, yeah, I would like to work with Chase, with this and that. And these are like the, ma they were the major players. I said like, eh, no. So I had to rethink and I go, okay. Then I go to, I don't know, Schiffsbank Bremen. Uh -huh. And so I started off with a client like that. And I called the guy up in Bremen. I said, look, by coincidence, I'm in Bremen. Have you got time for a lunch? <laughs> Amazing. And the product we dealt, it was so high level. So only the top members of the board were able to negotiate with me. And you imagine I was beginning of 20. I'm mm -hmm. calling the board. I mean, they were all 50, 60. They were amused by me. Of course. Like, it was also a bit refreshing and surprising yeah, that and you I, dare. Of course. And I said, like, hey, look, I'm here. I would like to give you good service. And I, they were just, they, they couldn't stop probably laughing. Yeah. And still, that's how I started. And the career for me ended when I had a team of 30 people under me. Wow. And I said, like, okay, look. Now I achieved what I wanted to achieve mm -hmm. on this particular thing. Now it's only return of money. Mm -hmm. And I was not interested in that. I was interested in the point that I can make it as a person, f for and, uh, foremost and first as a person, mm -hmm. and then as a woman. Mm -hmm. And on the third, that everyone told me you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. And when I changed the career, it's, it started the same way. Everyone said, you cannot do it. You know, you cannot make a change. I said, why not? Just going to art without studying art history or, or... Yeah, in the beginning, of course, I had to go back to school. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, but these are all problems I can solve easily. Mm -hmm. I go back to school. I, you know, not that I teach myself, but I can get the education. Mm -hmm. Come on, that's mm -hmm. not an obstacle. Mm -hmm. And so I started off in London with uh, Art Drepko and an artist actually gave me the trigger. She was a student mm -hmm. and uh, she looked for a home and I lived in London and she stayed with me for mm -hmm. a while. And I said, look, nothing is free in life and it's not good for a relationship. You know, you have to do something. I do something. I have a bit more than you have. So we exchange. Mm -hmm. So she gave me a, a painting in 
per month as a student in exchange. Ama- oh, okay. And what did you do with those paintings? They, I still have them, all of them. Oh. I haven't sold one of it. Oh. They're in my storage and one day maybe, but at the moment, I no, I won't sell it. And um, so that's how it started. And then, you know, she ran out of money. I found her money with other people. I said, look, we have to support the... And so this this is the way how it started. And this was the way how I started education. Then art history came into play. Um, art management came into play and, and so on and so on. Mm-hmm. And um, so this is the way how I started. And when I went back to Switzerland, it was a coincidence. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I stayed here. I, mm-hmm. I, my plan was for two, three months coming back to Zurich and then going back to London. Mm-hmm. And then I stayed here. And now it's history. I'm here for the moment. And, uh, but I travel a lot, so mm-hmm. it's yeah. a good equilibrium. I saw that you travel, you, you spend a few months in Latin America every year almost. Um, you were even in New York uh, for a while. Um, then now coming back to Latin American art, I mean, you were, uh, you mentioned half Swiss, half Brazilian. Was that that uh, gave you the interest to look more into Latin American art or h- how did that start? Was it the traveling there? Um, no, actually, it started with the first question of being a foreigner mm-hmm. and a foreigner in Switzerland. Because when I moved to London, that was not the question if you're a foreigner, because everyone is a foreigner in London. Mm-hmm. In the community, I moved around. Everyone was from all over the planet. So mm-hmm. it was not special if you say you're from Switzerland mm-hmm. or if you're from Brazil mm-hmm. or if you're from wherever. It didn't really matter. But here you're exotic. And here you are much more exotic. The only thing gives it away if you speak perfect Swiss German. Mm-hmm. So they couldn't put you in a cupboard. Mm-hmm. And and I hate being in a cupboard. So so that's that's was on the beginning was not actually my subject. Mm-hmm. But my former business partner said, you know, you have all these tools. Why don't you use your tools? Mm-hmm. Why don't you use your history in reverse mm-hmm. of being a foreigner? Mm-hmm. And I said, like, yeah, well, it's maybe a good idea. And then we said, okay, let's make a focus on Latin America. Mm-hmm. And for me, it started, okay, but if we make a focus on Latin America, that means I'm going traveling <laughs> because I cannot just say I'm from there and, and I haven't seen the countries. And if you travel, I mean, if you know one thing of Latin America, Mexico has nothing to do with Argentina. And Argentina has nothing to do with Brazil and Colombia is not Venezuela. And and every country has their own history, has their own background and has their own references. Mm -hmm. And for the I started actually my journey in Argentina Mm -hmm. and uh, I traveled everywhere in whole Latin America, hardly by uh, plane, only by bus. Mm -hmm. Because I really wanted to learn what the people were about. And I used like a four pillar method where I was asking questions about culture, politics, religion, mm-hmm. and economics. And in all these countries, it moves a bit around. Mm-hmm. And obviously, you always have a subject to talk, always, with everyone. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's always important um, to, to talk, even with the bus driver, because mm-hmm. he has valued information about the country, and about politics, Absolutely. and about economics, and religion, and art, even mm-hmm. that. So I found it very um, inspiring, and I I got welcomed everywhere with open doors, mm. I have to say, even like collectors, you know, I called them up and I said, look, hello, <laughs> I have a copy here, could you show me something? And they were more than happy to open their doors and, and show the, the richness of their culture. Mm, amazing. Then in this book, you, you mentioned uh, Latin American countries. There, each country is its own country, of course. Um, and and this is one of the questions that you ask in this book: if there is such a thing as Latin American art. So, you just gave me this book, so I didn't have a chance to look at it. But can you tell me if there is such a thing? Well, yes and no. I mean, first of all, the book is. Um, is basically uh, a time frame over six years which I traveled extensively. While we had uh, the gallery, I traveled every month, uh, every year about, mm, I would say, four to six months. Mm-hmm. Because uh, the, the, key, the key thing is actually time. Because if you go in somewhere for one week on a fair and you see a fair, you don't get anything. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't understand. You, this, is, you know, this is just for entertainment. 
but to try to understand and to learn and having a humble view, not a colonized view. Because even me, I have a, you know, um, with my background, I have also, so you need time. So this is one thing, the time question um, is very relevant. Mm -hmm. And for Latin American art, I think the people outside, mm -hmm. they need it like this the etiquette. Yeah. But not that they get a stamp because you wouldn't say this is Swiss art or a nuance of Swiss art or European art. You probably wouldn't. But the problem, or for me, the interesting part is that in the wider world, if you talk about Mexico, they think it's South America. So if they talk to me and say, oh, Andrea has been again in South America and Mexico, mm -hmm. then I know I haven't fulfilled yet my task mm -hmm. because geographically, actually, it's North America. Mm -hmm. So I really keep insisting of saying the term Latin America mm -hmm. to give a geographical place. Mm -hmm. After this, of course, there is it's much more variety. And as I said before, there is so much history but on the beginning, you need to first learn the, the correct term. I think it's important for them to get their identity. Because in Switzerland, or maybe Switzerland is not a good example, but like in Britain, no one would discuss about that. Mm -hmm. Britain is Britain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you have the history of, of Great Britain. Mm -hmm. I mean, th this is, is not the same thing. So it's totally clear where Great Britain is. Mm -hmm. Maybe now after Brexit, no. <laughs> but beforehand, it was very clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, then you worked with, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to mention one example, uh, Ernesto Neto, Brazilian artist. Um, I visited his, his Gaia mother tree in the Zurich main station uh, that was, uh, was a Fondation Baylor installation. But you worked on that as well. Can you tell us what was your role there? I mean, it was a huge installation for the ones that saw it at the main station. I'm sure we can show a picture. Uh, I think I also have some video um, footage of it. Um, what was your role there? Well, first of all, uh, Nesto Neto is an amazing human being and um, we met him for the first time in 2010 in, in Rio where we participated at the fair um, Art Rio mm -hmm. and this was a great concept which was not booth, it was more, it had like a living room and then artists, they showed a piece and you presented the artist and it was hilarious. And it was created by Julieta Gonzalez and Pablo Leon de la Barra. And we met there, we met uh, Ernesto Neto. And we worked with two other artists, um, Felipe Mujica and mm -hmm. Joana Onsueta. And he was, uh, he loved the pieces of Joana Onsueta and Ernesto bought a little piece of mm -hmm. Joana Onsueta. This is how we got to know mm. Ernesto Neto. And with my former business partners, we always stayed very uh, much in contact with Ernesto. And when the project came to Zurich, um, it was that it was the Zurich part was created by Daniela Zimmann and Damien Christinger. And Damien Christinger was my former business partner. And Damien and I, we, we worked very well together and he called me up and he said, Andrea, we need a product, project management on the weekend programs. Because for Ernesto Neto, it was very important to invite philosophers from all over the world, mm. also three different tribes, to, to explain what he's really doing and to start a conversation. I think for him, it's very important that we exchange conversation in the true matter as it can be exchanged. So it's not only people from the art world who say, wow, it's a fantastic piece. So it's also, we had like a poet from India who is normally, she's writing about birds. But it's, it's uh, or the, um, there was a Swiss guy who is into agriculture in Brazil. And we invited all these people to make a side program. And my role was there actually to overview the project. We had also a priest, uh, w which was the second highest next to Dai Lama. And of course, you, you, you know, from picking up from the airport to the hotel, we, but we have fantastic conversation all in the middle. And uh, this was an amazing, it was a lot of work, mm -hmm. um, but it was an amazing uh, mandate from Ernesto. Mm -hmm. And for, for Ernesto, it was very, very important that all these people came together. They were from nearly all the um, five different continents. The only person which, we, which couldn't come to Switzerland 
was a writer from Uganda because he couldn't get the visa in the last second. Huh. But all, all the rest, we it Norman. functioned, you know, in the mm -hmm. terms of perfect. Mm. Yeah, I remember that it was a big tree in the hall and I went in there with a colleague of, of CNN Money Switzerland at the time where I was working and we did a small uh, story on it and I just entered and you felt so peaceful and calm. It was almost like people were in there meditating, sitting. It was so inviting. It was amazing to see that people just passing by would come and see and I'm sure that they were had no connection to the art world many of them that would just come um and and how was that project financed was it something that Fondation Baylor just to understand a little bit how these projects art financing fine you know happens here how easy it is now of course it was very difficult and he used up I think all the budget from the museum Baylor and then some um, no, he paid that for himself. Oh, he, wow. Uh, he financed the project. No, I, oh. I, no, no, I really mean for Ernesto, and this is why I admire him so much. For him, money is just a tool, hmm. a tool to do things. And uh, for me, it's the same. Of, hmm. Obviously, I have not as many tools maybe as he has, but it doesn't matter. And he wanted to, to organize this, so we have this program for this weekend, so we can invite the people from all these different tribes, these philosophers. I mean, it was very important for him that the audience could get a glimpse, not only in his world, but in our own world. Mm -hmm. And I found it very, or I've, I found it very um, interesting that we had to see people from a Hunikuin tribe to have a connection with nature. But I can go with you here in, in the Hunkerberg and I can show you the woods. Mm -hmm. And I go every second day, I have my walk in the woods and it's amazing here. So sometimes we have things in front of us and we don't see it mm -hmm. because we get wrapped up by our daily challenges. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of mirror he, he showed uh, to, ref to give us this reflection. And also Gaia Mother Tree in this main station where it's hustly and bustly and, you know, you're running from one part. Hopefully it's happy, but sometimes it's not. Mm -hmm. And then you go in a fair where you really can let go and start meditating mm -hmm. and even become spiritual mm -hmm. in an um, impossible place. Mm -hmm. Basically, it showed us we are all able to do that. And mm -hmm. it's kind of giving us hope. And this was two years ago, mm -hmm. nearly three years ago. At the moment, it will be impossible almost. At the moment, it will be impossible, but still that kind of thought of reflection mm -hmm. that you can have your little paradise, whatever mm -hmm. you call him, for everyone is different. You have this within you, mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter where you are. Mm -hmm. And I think that kind of gives hopes for everyone mm -hmm. else, especially with the last year was so difficult mm -hmm. when terms of freedom become a completely mm -hmm. new meaning, you know. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. I, I, can, I, I mean, for me personally, the last few months have been also a bit of time of reflection. You were forced to stay at home most of the time, but it also opened up, opens up new ways that suddenly, as you say, one might go to the woods and, and um, just have time to, to reflect and reconnect somehow. Yeah, we live in such a speedy Life, I mean, Zurich is actually quite slow. If you go to New York or you go to London, life is fast, fast. Mm. And to, to make a pause and to think about things, I mean, that's true luxury if we mm -hmm. can do that. that. That's the good part. Mm -hmm. um, then you mentioned a few times Damien, uh, your, your uh, business partner. You had a gallery together, as, as you mentioned before, from 2009-2015. Uh, then you closed. Um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, mid-sized, smaller galleries around the world that have issues at the moment. Sometimes it's hard and they have to close down also with competition of these big global um, Amazon-like galleries, sometimes they're called. Um, can you tell us a little bit what was the context, um, why you closed, what, what, what was... You also mentioned a little bit the, the fourth industrial revolution. What, what were the reasons? I mean, when we started the gallery, we wanted to show um, great art, obviously, mm -hmm. but we also wanted to build bridges between continents, um, between thoughts, between ideas. And we did this for six years. And everything has its course. And we could have gone on 
mm. then we would have probably now the problems. I mean, yeah, the society, what I meant before in change is that the younger generation, or much younger than me, they have a different thought about what ma what value is and what it means to them. And I'm um, just starting off with the shared economy. It will, will go much further. Mm. The life balance. I mean, as I said before, the education. When I started, it was we should have done this for the next forty years, and now you plan ten. Mm -hmm. If you have a gallery, we 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 were thinking of like the the big ones around us who are already here for fifty years, but. 50 years having the same idea, doing the exactly the same, is also kind of a standstill. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to be very sure in what you do. And, and to be honest, we saw each other more than a labor, than mm -hmm. a financing through and through gallery. We had a, an amazing time. And uh, especially, I mean, f I only can talk about myself, I have learned so much mm -hmm. about so many different fields that is probably one of the most profound experience I had this very um, uh, content six years mm -hmm. and then things come to the end and we were maybe a bit early in the so because we were questioning us so where are we in two three in four years in five years and will this ever be financially um, make sense and we had to be honest I mean to say well, financially, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah. And so which other sense does it make? And it has to be either one or the other. Yeah. At least two points of three have to work. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have to change something. Mm -hmm. And I think Damien wanted to write more and I wanted to do more something else. So we said, you know, you know, let's it, do something else. It's an amazing learning. Uh, I... I mean, I, I worked at CNN Money Switzerland, a, a media startup, um, and it folded in 2020 after three years. And many people are also like, oh my God, it finished. Yes, it's sad, but at the same time, so much that I learned and everything I can take now and build up on that. And it opens new opportunities. And I can imagine that that's more or less like I, you just take it with you. And then that, well, that's for sure. I mean, that's my experience. It's also this why I wrote the book that I wanted to end it with with a jewel. Mm -hmm. So, and the jewel is also the, the cover of the book actually has a, a meaning, you know, the black is actually the black gold, it's the caoutchouc of mm -hmm. Latin America. The gold is from El Dorado. Mm -hmm. The white map is still where it's politically seen and only white I folks see are. now that this is Latin America. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I had a thought about <laughs> when we did the cover or actually the designer had a thought about it. And I said, like, wow, you really catched what I wanted to say. And um, yeah, so this is now a jewel of, of these six years. And now obviously it goes mm -hmm. on. And this also why I called it, it was a nuance. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, the journey goes on. It hasn't stopped. Mm -hmm. And for many of my colleagues who also had to close, some of them fell quiet in an empty hole. And, mm -hmm. and for me, it went like, day two like this and I said okay I wait for my hole and I wait for when I have time mm -hmm. and, and it never came it's now five years later wow so in the first year I did a show with von Barta mm -hmm. in Basel with uh, 10 Latin American artists and it went on mm -hmm. until now great let's hope <laughs> yes no I'm, I'm sure you have a lot of energy uh, it's also what I've heard from when I told um, other people that I'm meeting you it was oh she has a lot of energy. But coming back to the galleries, I mean, this space where we are in here used to be a gallery or many galleries before. So it's also a place where a mid, small, mid-sized gallery. Do you see a lot of them closing? Yeah, I think I think the, fundamentally we have to rethink the position. I think when you start off, and this is of, even when I started, I didn't start, I'm doing now a gallery and this is my business plan. And if I haven't achieved my money goals after year two, I have to restructure it and after three doesn't work. And latest after four years, if, if the idea doesn't work, we close. No, no one starts like that. So you start with a project, then mm -hmm. you, you have a bit of a success because on the beginning, mm -hmm. everyone is supporting you and then it drags on. Mm -hmm. Then you have a few things which is not a success mm -hmm. and then you don't know how to deal with the non-success because no one talks about non-success, mm -hmm. especially in Switzerland. You cannot, you know, 
close something down and restart or because it, it's you, you're kind of a loser and which has nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. It's a process. Mm -hmm. And when you do mistakes, you learn from it and then you get up and you go on. And um, so I thought um, this was always very important. And, and to this space here and to all other mid-sized galleries, if, I think if the smaller galleries would say, let's do this project for five years mm -hmm. from the start, because after five years, probably the money run out or, you know, because you don't earn a lot of money, you, you don't go on holiday because it's really the thing. Mm -hmm. Let's do it for five years, having a blast doing you work with 10 15 artists which you work anyway mm. during that period and you, and then you stop at the high of when it is that will give a complete different view absolutely then you wouldn't say oh are you closing mid-size gallery then you will say i did the project for five years and i do something else amazing yeah so it's a completely different view of how you see things that would help smaller galleries mm. and then the other thing is you know on everyone's ego I mean, to say that you haven't made it, you haven't made it to one of the big galleries, mm -hmm. but sometimes you don't have to. Mm -hmm. And you maybe you don't have the financial means to it either, but you have brilliant ideas mm -hmm. that you always will, you know, take along or away from the project. Mm -hmm. So I think there, the pro you should be smaller galleries or mid-sized galleries should think in a different term. And they will have to now, as mm -hmm. I said before, they, the, the values of the, the younger ones change. They don't want to have the walls full. They have small apartments mm -hmm. where they put all the art. Mm -hmm. they, it, it's, it will not be the same way. Mm -hmm. And COVID has shown it dramatically. Because it's just about having things that just would have bought it online. But it doesn't work like that because art is much more than just buying online. It is also a society thing, a social interaction between people. And then if you look actually at the art in life, it's different than you've just seen in pixels. Mm -hmm. It's just not the same. And digital art, where I curated last year the Latin American section, if I will be very critical to myself, I also thought in the all the structures and when it was there i was like okay next time i'm, I'm going to do it even better <laughs> in, in terms of it even me you know that i think like in these old structures mm -hmm. but digital is not you put something analog and you make it digital mm -hmm. you have to really rethink mm -hmm. completely mm -hmm. you have to put the sheet blank and restart mm -hmm. and why not mm -hmm. and there you know my old spirit comes back let's conquer the world <laughs> you know so you mentioned now the digital art, you were referring to the digital art festival in Zurich that happened last uh, September, October. Uh, October. In October, yeah. it was the very first uh, digital art festival in Zurich. That's where we met as well. Yeah. Um, and now also this COVID-19, the pandemic's accelerated digitalization in the art market, in the art world, because it was not very digitalized, no, with these uh, online viewing rooms, Art Basel, um, and you said it's not the same thing. So how do you experience it? Do you see uh, where are the advantages of what you've seen right now happening? Online viewing rooms, I don't know, selling art, uh, new apps coming up. Well, I, I first think the art world has made a fundamental mistake. Number one. Okay, wow. <laughs> Curious to hear that. Uh, because we put now all the content for free on the internet. Mm. I mean, I was asked, this was a few years ago, of a startup to make a platform for artists where you could visit the studio, but you have to pay, mm -hmm. um, like Patriots or something like that. And I thought the idea was so brilliant. It didn't came off for whatever reason. And now it's for free. Now it will be obsolete anyway, because every gallery gives you for free. They give the inside of what they do for free out of pure um, being afraid of losing something out. They haven't thought it through because it was too quick. They couldn't stand still for a minute and say, okay, what are we doing about the situation? Not one gallery, you know, let's say 50, 100 galleries. That would have been such a power. Like now, you cannot read newspapers anymore if you don't pay, which is good because the journalist needs to make an earning. The artists need to make an earning. Completely wrong thought. Artists will always make art. But maybe you don't buy as much. But if you give an insight to an artist, what they think, what they do, and he gets paid for that, it's the same as journalists. Why do we give it for free? I think that this is my personal opinion. 
totally wrong mistake. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it can be reversed. So we made a mistake, may, I don't know, out of, or out of gear, I don't know. I, it's, it's, um, I mean, you mentioned the, the media world and, and as, a, as a former or still journalist uh, work, working for, for several media companies, it's the same. It, it also started with the free newspapers putting content out there for free and then people start buying less and less newspapers. Now a few have paywalls, but those paywalls are also not so successful because we're just used to get all the news out there for free. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I so I think this is one part which, which we already mm -hmm. gave away. The, the fares which they changed last year from, from physical to online, again, they needed something to do. But I spoke with a lot of collectors and they said, look, Andrea, I'm not going on a platform with 300 galleries, 5,000 different pieces of work. I mean, I'm not going to be there for 72 hours online. Forget it. So I'm going because I know you and then I click on the whatever and then I say to you, can I see it? Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's not online. This is what I mean. We think analog in digital. If you do digital, it's a project about digital, digital. About digital art or about, yeah. Also in the, yeah, in the thinking. Virtual rooms, if they're really well done, a virtual world, that could be very interesting. I think there lies, and then it's not hours, then it's two minutes, mm -hmm. not hours. We, our brain will stop. Mm -hmm. It's not the same because it, like in a book or in a film, it needs the start and the medium and then the finish. It needs this dramaturgy. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't have, you, you say, you click away. Mm -hmm. The world is too fast. Mm -hmm. The same in video art. I mean, I love video art. And for me, it is I, I go and I see, I sit down, I need to sit down. I think all the museums make a fundamental mistake if they don't give you seats to sit down because mm -hmm. you will not stand for 30 minutes and mm -hmm. watch it. Mm -hmm. So you need to sit down, you think, and then you go home and then you reflect about it. Mm -hmm. And on the internet, it's much quicker. And it's the same way you need a seat where you can sit down and then you see it and, and you start to reflect mm -hmm. about it. I think there's big potentials, but we know we're there yet. Mm -hmm. Have you organized an online viewing room? Yeah, we did um, at May 36. We did actually a few um, virtual shows. And funny enough, they, um, the audience, they write back to us. And then again, you know, they say, can we see the, the painting or, or the phot photography or whatever it was? Mm -hmm. Can we see it in drill? Mm -hmm. That's my conclusion. We mm -hmm. sold, but it was not, if you don't know the artist, if you don't know the habitus of, of the work, you're not going to buy it like this and you spend X amount, thousands of mm -hmm. francs, dollars or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, I mentioned that you're also a lecturer at the University of Zurich uh, for the Art Market Executive Master, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, yeah, I think you have a new uh, semester starting in autumn. So you just had one. Um, and, and I'm curious to hear, you know, the work with your students. Uh, you also were mentoring a few of them. Um, I mean, you already gave so much here, uh, advice. What are the things that you try to share with them? Or what are the main things, messages for them? I know they're all trying to make it in the art world, I guess. <laughs> what are the concerns that they have? Um, yeah, if you can share a little bit the work that you do there. I think first... I think most of them are surprised that I'm so open and honest to speak because the art world sometimes is not as transparent as we think or mm -hmm. some hope. Um, I try to bri break this cycle a bit open because, as I said, knowledge you can learn, you can get today. The, the special thing is you as an individual and how you create what you know. That, and no one else can do it in the same way as you can do it. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any problems to tell you how it works because you will do with the information exactly what you want to do and how you probably grew up in your memory cupboards. You have, you, you take this out and say, aha, uh -huh, I learned this. And how you grew up in your family, you will react on my information different and that's how you're going to do it. I'm not scared of you know, competition mm -hmm. because it's only me. There is no other Andrea. Mm -hmm. And I think if people would take their ego mm -hmm. a bit back and take their competition thought a bit back, then they would realize, even in sales. 
if you in front of a person, the person wants a blue painting and you only have red, you will not sell the red painting. No way. So it doesn't matter how good I will be, it, I won't sell it. Mm -hmm. In the same way, if I, if I want to enchant the person, mm -hmm. if I cannot enchant the person because we don't click, I can do whatever I want, I will not enchant that person. And, and life for me is a, is a mystery and is actually about magic and to put magic a bit in the world. I know it sounds idealistic, but I want to be because I know reality mm -hmm. kicks in anyway. Mm -hmm. So from that point, no, I'm not scared of, of sharing my advice or mentoring. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, I also get mentoring. Mm -hmm. It's not that I don't get, uh, that I know everything mm -hmm. from I don't know where. Of course. I have an 86 year, six year old woman who is mentoring about life has nothing to do with art, about being positive. Mm -hmm. At 86, she wants to live. Mm -hmm. And in her world, she still conquers the, her place and her world, which I admire most. And if I hopefully become 86, I, I want to be like her. And this, we need more role models also amongst women to support us. Mm -hmm. And I have others where have supported me a great deal. Mm -hmm. Now I just, uh, when you were talking about this lady 86, I was just, uh, that wants to live, I was just thinking about Frida Kahlo. She didn't reach that age, of course, but her, one of her last works said, Viva la vida, right? Absolutely. Live life, even though with all her suffering. Of, of course, I mean, she was an important figure for all women, not only in Latin America, you know, to, to be free. And, and as I say before, you know, well, freedom is, becomes completely different meaning now in this COVID time. You know, it's, it's not only traveling, it's also you know, in society where you go, how you think. And, and women have been repressed. I mean, you all know that. I don't need to mm -hmm. retell that. But now is a different time and we, we can support us and we can, you know, build networks and we can give each other's mentorships because this is how we learn if we have a role model in front of us. So we say, oh, if she can do it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. And this is a good trigger. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't mind. I don't care. I say, yeah, go, go for it because you will do it anyway different than me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that I, I, for me, it was very inspiring to listen to all of you, uh, what, what you had to say. And I hope it inspires many of our listeners. Thank you very much, Andrea. Maybe just one, one more thing looking ahead. We talked a lot about what you did in the past, but now looking because it's the beginning of the year, what can we expect? I mean, maybe it's a bit difficult to do plan to have to, to plan anything, but, but what are your thoughts for, for, for the future? Well, I, I wrote this morning, I wrote a letter to myself uh, for this year, what my wishes are for myself mm -hmm. and what my aims are for, for myself this year. This year, my focus will be uh, to learning. Mm -hmm. So the first step is that I'm doing this uh, class at the University of Basel, mm -hmm. that I open my thinking strategies in my head. Mm -hmm. um, this is my first focus. And then... My second focus is for a show in autumn, three Brazilian ladies, more will come and other adventures are in planning and on hold and depends on COVID. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, and to all of you, if you're interested, the book, uh, I actually Googled it. You can get it on Amazon, on many places. Everywhere everywhere um so you can check it out where else could we we can check out may 36 gallery yeah or el fusely has it turner's um is the um the public publisher. Uh, the publisher they have it and uh, oscar around <laughs> exactly ask around <laughs> Thank you so much for thank being you for with being us here. and thank you very much for listening. And if you liked what you've heard, then it would be great if you subscribe uh, to my channel to um, get an update when the next art and business talk is out. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>